As we continue on Hannity and Combs, and we continue with former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich. Mr. Speaker, Newt.org, you have a newsletter, and the headline in a recent one was Real Change or Catastrophic Defeat, and that is time for a Republican wake-up call. Uh, in that, you talked about losing Dennis Hastert's seat, a seat that Republicans had held for 76 years but for Watergate. You talked about a district in Louisiana which President Bush won by 19 points in 2004. Now we have a seat that was won in 2006 in Mississippi that was lost by eight points on Tuesday. What does this mean for the Republican Party? Well, I think this is, I can't imagine a more decisive and a clearer wake up call. The country is sending a clear signal. They want to see dramatic, real change. And I outlined in that particular newsletter, and as you know, I, it's a free newsletter that goes out every week that people can get at newt.org. Um, and I outlined in there nine initial steps just for the first couple of weeks. This was not a complete uh, program. In fact, this week my newsletter was on the politicians' energy crisis and outlined an entire series of changes on energy. Yeah. But I think Republicans have got to understand, people don't want talk, people don't want slogans. People want to see decisive, real right. action. But, uh, this is an ongoing discussion we've had here. I actually think this is, th if this doesn't serve as a wake-up call, the loss of three highly conservative seats. You know, these are seats that never should have been lost. Right. Uh, if they don't ad adapt the bold agenda in the next 173 days, if they don't come up with something similar to a contract with America, energy independence, eliminate earmarks, uh, balance the budget, offense war on terror, secure the borders, no nationalized health care. If they don't put their signatures on a piece of paper, I don't see an, an organize quickly and inspire people. This could be a disastrous election for Republicans. Can it not? Yeah, I, I think that the, the first threshold for people is that they're very angry with where the Republican Party got them. And unless the Republicans send a clear signal that they've gotten the message and that they're really changing, I think people are probably going to punish you, do them you this have, Do you have any faith that they can do this or will do this? Yes. yes. You have oh. faith? No? That's a no. Do, do you, is that a no? <laughs> That's a no. No, 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 no. I, I couldn't hear you. There was a technical right, no, no, question. Do you have any faith that the Republican leadership is going to organize a coalition and do something like this? I think it is possible, but I think it's very hard. Legislative bodies are naturally very slow and very di divided, and they have a tendency to have the safest members sit around and say, "Well, I'm not going to lose, so I don't have to change at all." Mr. Speaker, I was reading your speech that you gave earlier today. You said we're facing our greatest crisis in the preservation of our government since the 1850s and 1860s. We've become less capable. We're decaying toward decisive defeat, decaying also in our economy and our education. Why should the American people reward the political party that's been in power that has brought us the very vulnerabilities you mentioned? Well, I think if you look at the whole country, both parties have more than enough blame to share, Alan. I think both parties have been guilty in a variety of ways. I think the collapse of Detroit, for example, has been almost entirely done by Democrats. I think other problems have been done largely by Republicans. And I think the real question for America is, is either of these parties going to figure out the scale of change we need? And is either of these parties going to offer a program of fundamental, real change that enables yeah. us to move in a direction that we have reason to believe will succeed? I, right. I think both parties can share more than enough guilt for where we are today. We had and I say that, by the way, yeah. as a person who's been an active Republican his entire life. I don't say with any pride. I wish my party had done a better job. Well, that's an honest and candid assessment, but we've had the, you know, Republicans running the presidency for eight years. Up until two years ago, they ran the House and the Senate, largely a result of what you did in 1994. You guys have been pretty much in charge for years and yeah, years but, and years. But, but Al, Alan, they completely, once I left in, 90, in 98, they completely underestimated how deep the changes have to be in the bureaucracy. When you look at the failure to react to Katrina, which was a disaster, you look at the failure to react to the Census Bureau collapse, which is a $15 billion disaster, you look at the failure to react to the Department of Energy collapse and clean coal, which is an absurd disaster, again and again, you look at the failure to clean out the State Department, well, which continues to be, I think, fundamentally opposed to Bush's policies. That's why Americans are likely to vote for somebody who hasn't been in Washington for a very long time uh, come November. Well, yeah. they might, or if they, unless they learn what he wants to do.
when they will. Thank you very much for being <laughs> with us tonight, Mr. Speaker. Coming up, as politicians uh, take sides in the Bush-Obama dispute, we're going to tell you where Senators McCain and Clinton stand on the issue, and their reactions are coming up.